I'm very glad to have you all here. Um, can you just give me a quick show of hands? Like, who has been in this room yesterday at the very same time to the very similar topic uh, that has been discussed at that time already? I only see one, that's great. Two, okay. Uh, so there's not a lot of overlap, that's great. Uh, so we got a chance to dive deep into the parts that we have prepared here for you. Uh, before we get started, uh, just very quickly about ourselves. Um, who are we actually and why are we standing here and speaking about this topic? Uh, well, I'm Max. Um, I'm the guy in yellow. Um, I'm a data engineering manager at uh, Zalando, uh, which is Europe's biggest online platform for fashion. And um, I've been working with data platforms for quite a bunch of years by now. And of course, like I've ran into the trouble quite a lot of uh, yeah, being responsible for a central data platform and with all the trouble that comes with that. And that drove me into two directions. On the one hand side, straight into the hands of Databricks uh, to become a customer as well and to start working with them and uh, be able to use a bunch of the fancy technology that they are offering, uh, but also into the hands of Data Mesh uh, because a lot of the things that we then started working on at Zalando uh, were very similar to the ideas that were actually shared there as well. And because of that, um, I also met Arif at some point, and we started uh, working a lot together as well uh, in terms of uh, yeah, advertising and advocating and also creating a lot of content around Data Mesh. Uh, but Arif, maybe you want to speak a bit about yourself as well. Thanks, Max, and uh, yeah, hello also from my side. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Arif. Uh, I used to be the head of uh, Data and AI for ThoughtWorks Germany. Um, so um, ThoughtWorks, as you may know, is a global IT consultancy, and that means I was working several years um, full-time as a consultant. Um, being with ThoughtWorks, that uh, most of the time meant that I was working hands-on uh, coding, um, leading data teams, uh, working as an engineer, and yeah, um, uh, working um, with our clients' teams. Also, um, being part of ThoughtWorks uh, brought me in contact um, to Jamak Degani, the creator of Data Mesh, very early as I was part of this global data leads team. Um, so I got uh, very early exposed um, to the concept um, of Data Mesh that yeah, was kind of developed from within ThoughtWorks. These days, I'm actually a tenured professor of software engineering at a Berlin-based university, HDW but um, I continue to work um, both as an independent consultant and also for ThoughtWorks um, yeah, uh, in industry on data mesh topics. Um, but now, in addition to that, I also um, look at data mesh and similar topics from a research angle. All right, let's get going. Perfect. So what do we have prepared for you? Well, the agenda that we have is actually pretty simple. We want to take a quick look at what this lake house actually is that has been introduced many, many times already throughout this conference. We want to take a look at data mesh and especially at our personal take of uh, what we think is actually super important and what you folks need to know uh, when it comes to that. And then we want to dive a bit into why we actually think uh, those two are actually two sides of the same coin. Um, or what exactly do we mean when we say that? So diving into the data lake house part. Um, here I do not only want to give the by the book introduction of data lake house, but I also want to share a bit how does the lake house at Zalando actually look like. So like sharing a bit of a practical note as well to that. But uh, before I do that, of course, um, I want to start with where are we actually coming from? Uh, and I always love to call that the oversimplified history of data analytics. And um, of course, um, there has always been the data warehouse, um, our trusted companion for the last half a century. Um, that was always there to get a lot of data in from many, many different sources uh, that were usually in a very distributed way. And usually at central teams that were responsible for extracting the data from all the different sources, doing a lot of preparation and putting it into our central data warehouse so that we have trusted data, that we have good sources that we were usually using to run our BI reporting um, and uh, some dashboarding on top of that to look at what was actually going on with our business. 
ultimately that did not scale anymore uh, so well because the amount of data were growing massively that we were actually looking at and around came the new kid on the block which was the data lake. Now we had the possibilities with all the cool new cloud technologies that were actually uh, being invented uh, and being put in place to basically store indefinite amounts of data. And unfortunately, so we did. <laughs> Uh, we really went to like huge amounts that we actually stored for no particular reason, just because we could, up until the point that we realized that storing indefinite amounts of data is actually leading to a lot of problems. Our data lakes were becoming data swamps. Um, nobody was actually going to find anything anymore. Uh, it was really tough to get to the things that you actually wanted to get. And even though the data lake was often in really good scale, from a technical perspective, it led to a lot of problems when it came to actually dealing with data on the organizational side. Now, what does this lake house thingy then mean actually with that? Because why can't we just have the best of both sides, right? And this is exactly where we want to go to the view of the data lake house by the book. First things first, you start with a data storage layer. Right? You want to still have the scalability of a data lake um, and you still want to use things like cloud object stores where you can score massive amounts of data. And the important part is that still you want to be able to, uh, to store all the things in ideally open formats um, that you can use, that you can um, then also uh, plug into many different compute engines, for instance, uh, to be able to actually work and deal with the data that you have there. And you want to be able still to store like any data that you have, be it structured, semi-structured, or even unstructured. But on top of that, you want to place a metadata and governance layer. And you really want to keep your metadata next to the data so that you can analyze what you actually have um, while being able to leverage additional information about the data that you store. And again, you want to have open formats for interoperability purposes. And um, you also want to use this as a possibility for schema enforcement and governance. But why do you want to do all that? Well, again, you want to support BI use cases as you did in the past, but you also want to use support uh, new use cases like uh, machine learning and data science that the previous data warehouses were not so capable of, um, surely because of the amount of computer was required to actually deal with those. And you wanted to have very high performance, uh, both for your ad hoc reporting and dashboarding, but you also wanted to have the scale and the reliability for your data science workloads. Now, how does the data lake house actually look like in practice at Zalando? Well, Zalando is um, largely based on AWS, meaning that when it comes to the storage layer, um, we are actually using AWS S3 uh, basically as the default for foundation for where we store our data. We have more than 10 petabytes of data just in our central data lake for that matter. And we have like another times that amount distributed across thousands of buckets that lie in different accounts all across the organization. When it comes to the metadata governance layer, we are big fans of Delta Lake. I was lucky enough to stand at this conference already three years ago and start talking about uh, our Delta Lake adoption and how uh, we were able to use that quite early on. And I'm still a big fan of uh, all the great things that it actually brings you in terms of the metadata management, but also in terms of the guarantees to work with good data. And when it comes to support of the BI and the ML use cases, we have a plethora of tools actually in place. Uh, one too many when you ask me, uh, but the things that we actually have in, uh, in practice are on the one hand side, of course, Spark on Databricks, uh, one of the most important tools that we have in the organization. Uh, but we also have tools like Trino as a distributed SQL engine with Superset on top of that uh, as a dashboarding solution. Uh, we have Redshift for localized data warehouses, uh, which also get the possibility to work with some uh, Delta Lake data sets that we have stored. And uh, we use SageMaker for most of our uh, machine learning workloads uh, in the company. And um, even though this is like a 
bunch of different tools that we have actually meshed together. And I can assure you there's many more that we haven't even mentioned here. Um, the good thing here is really the foundation that it builds up on top uh, and the possibility of all the tools that we can actually use and that we can leverage because we use open formats for the foundational layers that we have here. Arif, what about the data mesh? Thank you, Max. So um, yeah, we haven't talked about um, what uh, data mesh is here um, yet. So I'm not going to um, do a full introductory talk here on data mesh. We've seen some other talks, um, but yeah, there are just a lot of um, great resources about um, data mesh in general around. Um, instead, I will take a similar approach as Max just did with the data lake house. I will uh, first quickly look at what is data mesh by the book um, and then what it is in practice, right? And um, starting with this by the book approach, um, first of all, I think it's important to understand that data mesh or the components um, uh, that comprise data mesh um, are not really new by itself, right? So data mesh is really a synthesis of existing methodologies and best practices from operations software engineering applied to the data and analytics domain. Those existing approaches are primarily domain-driven design, product thinking, and platform thinking. And uh, a huge innovation of data mesh is to take those three existing approaches, combine them in a very unique way, and apply them to data and analytics where they have not been applied to before. Now, staying with this by the book pattern, um, usually data mesh is described as um, yeah, being based on four principles or four pillars. And those are first data as a product. Um, data as a product is the application of the product thinking methodology to data. That means you want to treat data sets or even machine learning models um, like a digital or physical product, right? Um, that means you wanna understand who your customers are. Um, you want to understand uh, maybe how you do marketing for that thing. Um, and you wanna have um, proper product management in place. And um, yeah, the things that you build there are called data products. Then moving to the Next principle here, it's um, decentralized domain ownership. That is the application of domain-driven design to data. And this is probably the uh, principle that is most associated uh, with data mesh um, because it's all about um, decentralization and going away from a central data team and instead moving data ownership to the individual business domains and give them autonomy um, and full ownership of the data. The third one, uh, self-serve data infrastructure, is really the application of platform thinking to data. And that is basically what the um, or platform thinking is what the big cloud providers, for instance, have been doing uh, for many years now very successfully. Um, they provide tools, um, uh, self-serve tools that make it really easy for people to yeah, set up big um, cloud infrastructure, for instance. And similarly here um, in the data mesh, uh, you want to have an data, a data infrastructure platform um, that allows it or that allows people who have not that much data engineering knowledge um, to still be able to create data products and uh, um, yeah, uh, get value from data. And then the fourth principle is governance. In the data mesh, you still need governance, data governance. Um, but the governance that is applied or that, that um, yeah, data mesh proposes is kind of the antithesis to the uh, 
yeah, to some of the traditional data governance, which can often feel like a governance police that is kind of all the time busy with um, checking whether everyone adheres to some global rules, right? So instead, with Data Mesh, we call it federated computational governance. And that means, first of all, federated means that um, the data governance group consists of representants from the individual domains. So they bring in their topics. And computational means that you want to automate as much of it as possible. All right, so that was the kind of three, four minute uh, overview what Data Mesh is. Now let's move from the by the book approach to the in practice uh, perspective here. And I think the in practice perspective is first of all about answering the question of why. Why do we even need a new paradigm for dealing with data? And what is the problem that Data Mesh is solving? And in fact, Data Mesh is really about solving the problems of people, right? Data Mesh is about people. And um, from my experience um, as a consultant working with many data teams and many companies, um, this, what you see here on the slide, is a situation um, that I have seen again and again, right? So on the left side, um, there are the data producers. Those are the people running production systems. Um, and um, yeah, uh, as a side effect of that, they generate data. And they are often kind of happy, right? They're kind of okay. They have different incentives. They are busy running their, their production systems. Um, but um, they don't uh, feel much of the pain that is associated uh, with, for instance, bad data quality. And then on the right side, um, we have data consumers. Those are uh, data scientists, decision makers, um, or just other uh, um, product teams that build things on top of data. And those folks, they um, yeah, are often not so happy. Um, so they really feel the pain of bad data quality, of data that is not well documented because they need to make some sense out of it, right? Um, so they, yeah, they are not so happy. And then in the middle, we have the third group. And those are the people that uh, build and maintain uh, what often is a central data platform with central data ownership. And those people are often data engineers, machine learning engineers, and they are really in a, in a very tight spot because they are often um, firefighting issues all day that have been introduced um, by changes made on the producer side, right? Um, and at the same time, they, are, they have to listen to the complaints that come from the, uh, uh, from the consumer side. And uh, even worse, those people in the middle, they often lack the domain knowledge to be able to fix the issues that come from upstream from the producers themselves. So they actually have to ask the data producers to fix the issue. Um, and they often even do not have a direct motivation or incentive um, because they are a bit removed from the actual data applications. So they don't even necessarily know or get the praise for the great things that are being built on top of data, right? So this is a really um, bad spot to be in and I have really I've been part of those teams, I've seen those teams, um, and um, this is not a great situation, and even worse, those are often um, the most seeked individuals uh, that you have in the company, and there is really quite a risk to, to drive them away. And um, generally, I've really often seen the situation that this team in the middle is perceived as a bottleneck that basically prevents the whole company from uh, from moving towards being more data-driven, right? So why are so many companies ending up in this situation that I just described? Well, 
Imagine that you have here on this picture on the left a growing number of data sources and on the right side a growing number of data use cases. And in the middle you have this central data platform with central data ownership. And now imagine that here on the left side um, we have as one of those data sources a checkout service. You know, let's imagine this is an e-commerce company and um, there is a checkout service um, maintained by a checkout team and this checkout service is generating checkout events whenever someone um, checks out um, a product, buys it or something like that. Now these events, they end up in the central data platform and because it's a central data platform with central data ownership, they're owned by the central data team, right? Now, what you see here is that suddenly the knowledge about checkouts, when the checkouts happen, what is even a checkout, right? The definition of a checkout. This knowledge is now scattered across teams, right? And it's exactly this um, issue that basically the boundaries of responsibility cut through domain boundaries here that is creating friction, creates misunderstandings, slows things down, etc. Right? And it's this little friction which if you only have a few data use cases is not a big issue, but if the number and not only the number but also the diversity of data sources and the diversity of data use cases are both growing rapidly, then this little friction really adds up and prevents the whole model from scaling and eventually leads to this um, bottleneck situation that I described before. Now, coming back to the title of this talk, Data Lakehouse and Data Mesh, two sides of the same coin. Well, what do we mean by this? Um, so first of all, we basically do not mean uh, what is probably the, the typical meaning of that idiom, right? In the sense that uh, data lake house and data mesh are the same thing. No, what we mean by this is more what you see on this picture here, where you see a coin that is kind of bent, right? And it means that the two halves of the coin, the two sides, um, are uh, on toggle orthogonal to each other, right? So that means um, they are independent dimensions that can be freely combined. So this is what we think of data mesh and data lake house. Data mesh is primarily an organizational approach, whereas data lake house is a technology um, and, uh, um, and a tool, right? And you can apply data mesh as an organizational approach. Um, and uh, you can gain some benefits, uh, but you can also um, apply Lakehouse independently as a tool and get other benefits, right? But we believe that um, they can really uh, benefit a lot from each other uh, when you um, combine them, right? And in fact, we believe that uh, it makes a lot of sense to combine a mostly organizational approach such as data mesh with the right tools and technologies and that it's the right thing to combine a mostly technology uh, approach or a tool set with an appropriate um, organizational approach such as data mesh. In fact, we feel that if you focus only on one of those two sides, um, things will actually not work out that well. To give a couple of examples of this, let's start with what happens if you only focus on the tech side of things and you kind of neglect the organizational change perspective. For instance, if you try to buy an out of the box data mesh solution or data mesh technology, but you do not embrace that there is a big organizational change component to it, um, you will actually not solve the problem that I just described because it's a problem of responsibility structures, right? And you won't change that uh, just by deploying a 
different technology. Same goes for if you have a big central data warehouse and uh, you have a lot of issues with that and you replace that big central data warehouse with a big central uh, lake house, well, you may see improvements on performance, uh, efficiency, et cetera, um, but you will not change the bottleneck that is your central data team, right? And even if you go down the route with decentralization, yeah, and you have a um, data lake um, that, uh, yeah, where, you, where no product thinking is applied on and you divide this uh, data lake into, let's say, 10 data lake houses, but you still don't apply product thinking to those data lake houses, this will not increase your time to insight, right? Now looking from the other perspective, what happens if you only apply organizational change without the supporting technology? Well, if you push all the data responsibility on the product teams, which is really part of the idea of data mesh, this shift left idea, right? Um, but you don't support them with the right tooling and the right technology, uh, it will actually just make the problem worse because they just have more responsibility, more work, they will be overworked and they will not support your case, right? So this is not gonna help at all. And this is where really shared self-serve infrastructure is needed, right? Um, there is no way that you create a data mesh and many, many data products without great shared data infrastructure it simply won't scale, right? You shouldn't replicate the data engineering efforts of creating a new data infrastructure again and again with every single data product. Um, and there are also other things where you simply need shared infrastructure, um, such as a, a data product catalog. Without a data product catalog, there is no data product discovery and therefore no network effect. And then finally, there's governance again. If you just decentralized data governance, right? And you give the responsibility of governance to individual domains, um, but you do not lift the enforcement of rules, of global rules um, to an automated level. Well then, there's simply the risk that um, the global rules will not be adhered to. Um, and then um, you just end up in a situation where um, you're acting irresponsible. All right, and with this, I will hand it back to Max, who will go even deeper into this. So, Arif has now told us like what are the two different uh, approaches missing without each other, but I want to now turn it around and dive into the parts on how they can actually strongly benefit from each other. When we're talking about two sides of the same coin, um, yes, they might be different sides and they might have uh, a lot of things that each has for themselves, but it still means they have a lot in common because ultimately both the lake house as well as data mesh are about scale. And the problem that they are trying to address fundamentally is still the same. It is all about the amount and the variety of data that we are looking at, and it's all about the data usage across many different user groups. And the data mesh on the one side solves the organizational problem of centralized data responsibility by applying decentral data ownership with central platform support, right? So it's really, as I already mentioned, all about putting the responsibility on the people that are supposed to actually own uh, the data, but at the same time to support them with the tools so that they can actually get the job done as easy as possible and it does not become an additional burden that they have to shoulder. At the same time, the data lake house solves the problem of enabling a large variety of use cases. And this is really coming from an angle of exactly what I just mentioned, to give the tools to actually make the job as easy as possible. So to provide performance and governability at scale and to really bring the people into the position that it's very easy to take care of uh, the additional responsibilities that they are asked to take on now. 
Now, once more taking the step to um, uh, saying that uh, when using each approach at the same time for the problem they are designed for, then they can really only benefit from each other, right? And again, like bringing up our beautiful picture here, technically those two are orthogonal to each other, but that just means they have, they are two different dimensions that are trying to address the same problem and when you really combine them, then there's a lot that you can actually get from that. And to round out the whole picture, I want to take this once more to the, to the technology side of things. Uh, and I want to really, yeah, understand like which needs can profit from which tools as they are available today. Starting off with data product creation, um, of course, when you want to have data products, you need to store them somewhere. So you're starting from a uh, uh, storage uh, angle. And cloud storage, as earlier mentioned, at Zalando we are massively using S3 here, um, but that is of course something that goes across all the vendors. Um, that can be uh, Google Cloud Storage, it can be Azure Blob, it can be S3. Um, there's many different options that you actually have here, depending on where you're actually standing. But at the same time, creating data products is also about transforming data. And you need transformational engines like Spark um, to actually bring you into the position that you can create your data products. When it comes to the technical metadata management, um, things like Delta Lake were really pushing forward here. Yes, there are other things as well, like Iceberg, like Hoodie, but from my personal experience, I still believe that Delta Lake is one of the most mature um, that you actually have in the space at the moment. And it really nets you the benefits of being able to deal with your data in a much more organized way. And in keeping your technical metadata close to the data itself, benefiting again a lot of the data transformation engines in better performance, but also in terms of the users that are then um, taking the data and using it for their cases. Decentralized data access management. There has just been Delta sharing that has been, uh, that has been everywhere over the whole conference uh, after already being announced uh, in the previous year. Um, but also things like Unity Catalog are super important when it comes to that. And I also have to say at Zalando, we don't share much data outside our organization, meaning something like Unity Catalog is actually much more important for us than something like Delta sharing is. Uh, because everything stays within our boundaries and then the simplicity of a tool that is directly built into the platform is more important than having the possibility to be open to the rest of the world as well. Last but not least, there are still a lot of things that are currently missing. Yeah, Data discoverability is only one of them. Data observability, um, governance, governance, lineage, like a lot of these things. There has been some really cool announcements already at this conference that start moving the platform as well into that direction, but there's still a long way that we need to go. And there's still a lot of things that need to be built where a lot of vendors are currently fighting for winning that race. Uh, but I'm super curious as well on how that will develop because of a lot of the things that I just mentioned are currently based upon in-house build solutions um, that are usually not even working that well unless you have a huge engineering team that puts a lot of effort into uh, making those happen. That being said, Lakehouse and Data Mesh are orthogonal to each other, but they can really benefit from each other as well, and that's why we think those two are actually the two sides of the same coin. And with that, I want to thank you, and we would be super happy to take a couple of questions as well if we still have the time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit or to give some experience on how you've managed to push the cultural change that's necessary to get this to work. Because my experience is, okay, you tell the product teams, please do it. And they say, that's not my job. I don't, it's because it's a really different interest. Data processing, data management, it's not software engineering. So. In your use case, checkout, the checkout team would just say, yeah, that's not what I want for my career. So how did you manage to push that cultural change? Yeah. 
It's a great question. Um, and this is actually the most difficult thing uh, when it comes to making this type of transformation. Um, in our case, particularly, it's super, like we, we try to start small. We try to start looking at very specific use cases where ideally the teams that we were working with were already at least a bit data savvy in the sense that they had an interest to actually start moving into that direction. And we use this as an opportunity to prove that taking on such responsibility actually adds value to the company as well. And then that like one chained into the other, we got more support also from the management side because they realized that this is actually something that makes sense, that started resulting in a couple additional investment cases into specific areas so that specific teams could maybe hire one or two additional um, data engineers or analytical engineers to actually then start moving into the direction and then it basically started growing from there. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that this really needs to be um uh, be incentivized positively, right? Remember that situation that I showed um, where basically nothing is moving anymore. I've really seen this in many companies and um, it makes sense to basically show a way out of this situation where nothing is moving anymore. Um, and then, uh, yeah, create a nice little example as Max said, start small um, and showcase how things could work differently. Um, and then ideally even have a, having a situation with a lighthouse project or so where um, people start telling, hey, we did things differently and this was really awesome. Um, and then other people say, hey, we want to work in the same way and this way kind of um, drive this through the company. Great talk. This has clarified the concept and process of the uh, data mesh. But from a technology side at Zalando, can you give us examples on how you have created the mesh? Like for different products, is it different for relating with Databricks? Is it different workspaces, uh, different bronze layers? Could you clarify from uh, implementation, please? Yeah. Um, so interestingly, we kept a lot of things very close to the setup that we already had before in the sense that we are still using S3 as a storage layer, we are still using Delta as a format, we are still using Databricks for the computational aspects, right? But um, for us, it wasn't so much about the technology changes for that matter, but really about like the organizational angle. And there was a couple things that we did in the sense of, for instance, allowing teams to store data in their own S3 buckets in their own, uh, in their own AWS accounts, and then having a decentralized approach when it comes to connecting decentral storage location to the central platform um, to be able to still process everything that was out there. And this led to a massive increase also in ownership because now it was not some data that I throw over the fence and it ends up in the central bucket and there it stays forever and I don't care about it anymore. But now this is mine, you know, this is something that I am actually responsible for and this is where like a lot of teams really picked up the pace and moving into that direction. We got another question here. Yeah, could you speak to how you upskill uh, the people in the organization to take on these tasks? Um, like if you could speak to also like the ratio of sort of internal people who do that for other, uh, for other teams um, in terms of how they're like distributed. It, it totally went into two directions. On the one hand side is really about educating people on how to use those tools. And there's a lot of investment that also went from the central teams towards educating people. But the other big, ang big angle is as well to simplify the platform so that th it's not required anymore to have this huge amount of upskilling that people need to do. And this was like one of the big points as well where we realized as well that we need to apply product thinking to our own platform as well uh, because we needed to make sure that uh, the teams get what they need for the skill level that they already have um, to really like simplify their job as well. Um, great talk. Um, just a question on where do you see this data mesh going? Because, you know, at one point we had the central uh, thing where the data engineers were responsible for managing everything. But as it becomes federated, like individual teams are managing that stuff. Like, so what's the role of the, you know, company wide, like data engineers and, you know, the data managing, man managing guys? Like, where, where does this end? You know, at what point do you say, like, we have distributed this enough and then, you know, like the rest, we, we kind of like keep it to the core. 
Yeah, maybe I can also quickly go that, um, at this from a more general angle, um, as I've seen several companies um, starting to adopt the, the data mesh pattern. Um, and in fact, that is very different depending on how your um, company is set up, right? So um, uh, if you have a company that is not very tech savvy and you do not have that many data engineers um, and, uh, and then software engineers even sometimes, um, you probably want to build a data infrastructure platform that is very easy to use and doesn't need uh, much um, yeah, uh, software engineering knowledge. And this way you really have most of your data engineers building that platform, so it's really easy to use. On the other hand, you have companies like Zando, which are very um, uh, tech focused, where you have quite a few uh, data engineers and many, many software engineers. And there I think you can go a bit more um, towards the yeah, pro interface side. Um, where um, you still um, want to um, yeah, move also data engineering knowledge into the different teams. Thank you. Thank you.